and welcome to The Spectrum Show. Coming up, we look at the news and top selling games from June 1988. I finally check out the recreated ZX Spectrum. I play some games. I chat to Jeff. And end with a tale of mystery. But first, it's the news. Ultimate Play the Game have announced they plan to release a massive collection of their games in one mega pack. Called The Collected Works, the compilation will include Jetpack, Psst, Attic Attack, Lunar Jetman, Cookie, Transam, Nightlaw, Alienate, Nightshade, Gunfright, and Saberwolf. The obvious missing title seems to be Underworld, but there has been no comment as to why it's not included. The pack will be available early August and will sell for $12.99 for the tape version and $14.99 on disc. The budget label Piranha has been closed down due to insufficient turnover. Originally launched in 1986, the company released games like Trapdoor, Strike Force Cobra and Yogi Bear, all of which have now been bought by Alternative Software, along with the rest of the Piranha back catalogue. There are still rumours of the next Spectrum, fondly called the Plus Four. Although there is no hard evidence for the machine actually being planned, some pundits claim it will have a Z80H processor running faster than the original one, a pixel resolution of 320x200 with no colour clash, and sound to rival the Amiga. Some people even say it will be released late summer, but users will have to wait and see. And that was the news, and now on to the top selling games. At number 5 is Driller from Incentive Software. At number 4 is Head Over Heels from Ocean. At 3 is Exelon from Houston Consultants. At 2 is Renegade from Imagine Software. And at number 1 is Match Day 2 from Ocean. And that was the news and top 5 Spectrum games for June 1988. There are many ways you can play Spectrum games on your desktop computer, on your laptop, on your phone, on your tablet. and obviously on the real thing itself. With the exception of the last one, despite being convenient, using emulators only gives you the visual sensation and lacks the authentic feeling of playing your favorite games again. In 2014, much to the initial delight of fans, the recreated Spectrum was announced, although Elite, the people responsible for the device, had been making noises about this since 2013. Originally crowdfunded from Kickstarter, the unit and the campaign were being managed by Steve Wilcox and his company Elite Systems. Elite have been in the Spectrum world from way back in the 80s, releasing a series of games including Blue Thunder, Commando, Boogie Boy and Bomb Jack. However, the company became known for dodgy dealings and possible fraud in 1986 when they launched a new budget company called 299 Classics. Starting on the 21st of July 1986, the 299 Classics label promised to publish one game every week, and their first four games were 3D Death Chase, School Days, Full Throttle and Valhalla. More games followed, however, it seems some of them were released without asking the permission of the original authors, and this obviously caused a problem. The end result, after several court cases and threats, was the label being closed down in November of the same year, lasting just five months. Elite gave all kinds of reasons and tried to move the blame away from themselves, but they still did not pay all of the royalties they owed, leaving some game authors frustrated and out of pocket. This kind of business ethic seemed to haunt the company, and fast forward to 2014, people that knew them were very cautious about their involvement in this new idea. Sadly, many enthusiasts jumped straight in, hyped on the nostalgia, and the campaign was funded with more than £60,000 worth of pledges. Rumours began to circulate that the device was just a Bluetooth keyboard in a Spectrum case, which turned out to be true. Not so bad, you might think, 
but then people started to claim that limitations in Bluetooth technology restricted the number of simultaneous key presses that could be used, meaning some Spectrum games would not be playable. It was also claimed the unit would be locked to just the Elite app, which was currently being developed, which also turned out to be true, and put off many would-be buyers. Why would you buy anything that locked you into something that may not always be there? Despite these issues, Elite had grand plans, but it wasn't long before things started to unravel. Some backers did not receive their device, and Elite had a habit of going quiet for long periods of time. Mid to late 2014, and things started to pick up, and in December, Steve Wilcox gave the world a glimpse of the pre-production unit, even getting a slot on the gadget show. The device went on sale on the 7th of September 2015, but still some backers had not received their devices and did not do so for several months after. Part of the campaign, and the thing that drew a lot of people in, was the special Manic Miner style version, signed by Matthew Smith himself. This was mysteriously cancelled though, so people who pledged more money to get this were let down, and only offered a normal device, and a refund. Even users who wanted to buy normal versions from online channels were having trouble. The stocks were just not there, and it seemed Elite were having problems with the manufacturer. Or, rather, the manufacturer were not being paid by Elite, and had called in the solicitors. In the foreground, however, things were moving on. They wanted to drive the unit via an online service, offering titles at cheap prices that could be added to the device or played online. They created an app for iOS and Android devices and got many games ready to be purchased. Yes, they wanted to charge you for games that you could download freely, just for the convenience of using their device. And they locked the unit, as rumoured, to only allow it to be used this way. They did get Matthew Smith, as mentioned before, involved in some of the campaigns, but this didn't do much other than generate sympathy towards Matthew himself for being involved with this thing. In a kind of time warp, it seems they didn't get the author permissions again, and this led to legal threats from the game's authors. Eventually, this resulted in the games and the app being removed from the store. With no games or app, this obviously rendered the unit useless. Around mid-2017, at least from various comments, I estimate this would coincide with the legal statement on the Kickstarter page about a settlement between Elite and the keyboard manufacturers. The app came back online, with a few games to play, and the keyboard could be used again, but it was still locked. However, there's still no guarantee that this app will be there forever. Elite though did release a tool to unlock the device to allow it to be used correctly with any Bluetooth device, and although many people say it's no longer available, if you visit their website and choose to play a game online, in the menu there is an option to unlock it. At the time of the crowdfunding, I stayed well clear of Elite Systems and refused to buy anything from them, especially at such an extortionate price. In 2017 though, you can pick them up for around £34, supplied by the original manufacturers. My unit arrived, and to be honest, I was excited to unwrap it. It was almost like getting a new Spectrum for the first time. The unit comes packaged in a small box, with the immediately recognisable Sinclair livery. The back too looked familiar, with the wire diagrams showing the box contents. Inside is a USB lead, a coaster, and there it is, looking beautiful, the unit itself. Underneath we get a mouse mat, a small user manual, and an even smaller instruction sheet. The keyboard itself is identical to the real thing. Here it is next to my original Speccy. The keys are almost identical too. They look and feel authentic. And the faceplate looks lovely and clean. The only place it's obviously not a real Spectrum is on the back. There's no edge connector or earphone sockets here. We get an on-off switch, a status light, a Bluetooth pairing button, a layer switch and a USB power connector. You can run the unit off batteries if you like, but why bother? Because the unit is a Bluetooth keyboard, it can of course be used as a normal keyboard for any device that has Bluetooth, for example phones, tablets, televisions or computers. There is a helpful guide on how to swap modes using the keyboard combinations provided too. The first thing I did was plug it into my PC. With this done I loaded up Notepad and I could type normally, no problems at all, even using symbol and cap shift. I then put some batteries in and connected via Bluetooth, because I already had a Bluetooth dongle. The device paired quickly by simply pressing the pair button and then detecting it on the PC. 
Again, the keyboard worked fine when set to layer B, which is the QWERTY mode. I'm not sure if my keyboard was already unlocked, so I went to the Elite website and first loaded the game into the browser, set the keyboard to layer A, which is game mode, and the game played as you would expect. No problems here apart from some sound issues, and the fact that the game looked rubbish with graphics that looked like they'd been compressed using a very poor setting in JPEG. I then chose an option to unlock the keyboard, and after some legal mumbo jumbo, I clicked agree, switched to layer B, pressed the cap shift as instructed, and nothing happened. I assume this was because my keyboard had already been unlocked, based on previous tests I had done. I then loaded up Spectaculator and played a few games, with the keyboard set to QWERTY mode, and everything went well. In that mode, the keyboard acts like a normal PC keyboard, so no surprises there. I then tried to play Invaders from Arctic Computing, and this game uses the cap shift to move left, and the game refused to acknowledge the key press at all. I tried the different key switching combinations and none of them seemed to make any difference. This was a bit odd, because in Notepad, the cap shift worked fine. I know there are only a few games that needed the shift key, and most of them have key change options. But for the odd ones like Invaders, well it's just tough luck. Because the cap shift and symbol shift are used to switch modes, they are not available in most emulators, meaning you can't go into extended mode for programming, or even enter quotes to load a game. If you are just playing games though, all emulators should work fine with this. For the vast majority of games, if you are looking for that authentic experience, then this certainly does the job. If you absolutely need the cap shift and symbol shift, some emulators support the keyboard in game mode, in particular Fuse, which is available on many systems. Using this emulator allowed the use of symbol shift and cap shift, just like the real Spectrum, so Invaders worked fine. It looks great and works and feels just like the real thing. For £34, it's not a bad purchase really, and occasionally you can get them cheaper on other websites. It's much less than the real machine and can be used on a variety of different equipment. And because it's using newer technology, it should hopefully last quite a long time. I have never bought anything from Elite, and never will, but buying from the manufacturer direct in an unlocked state, well, I'm happy with that, and I think it's a great little unit, especially at that cheap price. Fight was an arcade game released by Taito in 1986. It was a difficult vertical shooter with large colourful graphics, detailed backgrounds and hard gameplay. The usual power-ups are available too, along with boss battles and the bullet hell experience that some players love. The Spectrum version was released by Imagine Software in 1987. As most of you know, I love shooters, so I was really looking forward to getting into this game. As you can see, it's monochrome, which although allows for smooth scrolling and fast gameplay, it can sometimes be difficult to see the enemy shots. The backgrounds are detailed and do look nice, but tend to blur into nothing as the action hots up and the enemies start to flood the screen. The screen ratio itself has been changed by the addition of a sidebar to give a more arcade-like feel, but this restricts movement and can make things even trickier. As you hit enemies, they sometimes leave behind stars, and again, these are sometimes difficult to see, but if you collect them, they allow you to upgrade your ship. On the left hand side is a list of options, and as you collect stars, an arrow points to the option you can currently select. To select one, you have to press space, so even if you are playing with a joystick, this obviously means you still need the keyboard. Some background objects block your shots, but it's not clear which ones, so really it's down to playing the game a lot until you can map it in your mind, so you can avoid them, because although they block your shots, they don't seem to stop the enemies, which is a bit unfair really. The big letdown though is sound. 
Even on 1 to 8 machines, it's pretty poor. Just simple bleeps for firing and short bursts of white noise for explosions. We really should have better things in 1987. The action is fast and control is crisp, but the difficulty of the arcade has been transferred, making it just that bit more unenjoyable, well at least for me. I tried many times to make progress, each time being the victim of an unseen enemy shot, which soon becomes frustrating. Watching the RZX playback, the game does look challenging, which is how arcade games are meant to be, and that's how they're designed. They should encourage players to keep putting money into them, but home versions should not really have that goal. For me then, a disappointing game, and one you should only try if you are prepared to put a lot of time into it, and those who enjoy really challenging shooters. This is Discs of Death, released by Arctic Computing in 1985. No prizes for guessing which film this is based on. Yes, it's Tron. This game takes the disc fight sequence and throws you into the game with another competitor, in a kill or be killed situation. As you can see, the graphics, although simple, move really well, and the animation I think is great. You control the man nearest to you, and you can jump across the platforms trying to avoid the discs thrown at you. The jump is automatic, so all you have to do is move to the edge of the platform and you will jump to the next one. To throw your discs you press the up key, and your discs head off towards the other player. You can throw three discs at once, so you can fire a salvo and jump clear of any incoming opponent thrown discs. Your discs come back to you automatically, and you can't throw any more until they do. You can also deflect the opponent's disc by pressing the down key, but these are limited so you have to use them carefully. You have to keep moving, and it's a fast paced game. After a few games I did notice something that's not mentioned in the instructions, and also that makes the game harder if you choose to use it. Pressing the fire key moves a small bar left and right around the back of the play area. Press and hold it once and it will move right, release and press and hold it again and it will move left, and this is the target that your discs head towards, so you can actually use it to bounce shots off the walls. However, if you spend too much time trying to do that, you can't simultaneously watch that and the opponent's discs as well. So this does add another level of difficulty to the game. The graphics look good and the 3D effect works really well, and the sound is good too. I really enjoyed this game, it was fun to play and provides a nice challenge. Things get harder as the levels progress with homing missiles that are thrown by the opponent. These can't be dodged and the only way to get rid of them is to destroy them with your own discs, which is very tricky. I'm not sure if there's an actual end to the game, so I used an infinite lice poke and played for hmm, what seemed like hours, and the game just kept getting harder and harder. A nice challenge then, and definitely worth a quick play. This is Crystal Kingdom Dizzy, released in 2017. It was written by several people, whose names you can see on screen now. It's a rewrite of the original 1982 game by Codemasters, and indeed they have allowed this game to be re-released. This is a stunning remake, with beautiful graphics and added 1 to 8K sound. The game follows the usual Dizzy format, 
seeing the main character going on little quests and meeting many little characters along the way. There's even CJ, who has a little joke with Dizzy. And it's touches like this that make the difference, and this game oozes quality. To find some locations you have to jump off screen in the hope of finding something to land on, which is a bit scary, and this was the case when I was trying to find the screwdriver. I had searched all the screens I could get to and found nothing. I then decided to jump into thin air, and suddenly I was walking on clouds, that then allowed me to drop down into new screens that I hadn't seen before. The music certainly helps the game along, I spent ages playing this. It somehow just distracts you from life and lets you get involved in the game and the quests. The graphics are excellent as you can see, and the music is also good, and the control is what you'd expect. It's easy and forgiving. This is a highly recommended game, especially if you liked the original. This is Brainstorm, released by Micromega in 1983. This is a very simple memory game, the sort of thing that has been around for years and is relatively easy to implement, which is why it can be found in various type-ins. This, however, is a commercial release. The idea is to locate the number shown at the bottom of the screen by entering a two-digit code that represents the box displayed at the top in the grid. Each time you select a block, the number hidden beneath it is shown for a short amount of time. If it is the correct one, it remains visible, and then you have to find the next in the sequence. There is a limit on how many chances you get, so you have to try and remember which numbers are hidden behind which blocks, and hopefully complete all of them within the given limit. It's not a fast-paced game, and there's no time limit, and it's not particularly skillful. You just need to remember where the numbers are to be able to complete each level. As the levels get harder, there are more boxes, which means you have to remember more things. The graphics are not really worth mentioning because it's just a series of boxes in a grid, and the sound is a standard beep. I found it annoying that you can't enter your guess until the series of beeps have finished after each attempt, and this can mean you entering the wrong number. If you know the next number is behind box 01, for example, and type 01 before the beeps have stopped, you end up typing 1, and then have to follow it with another number that will make an incorrect guess. It's a slow-paced game of memory, and there's not a lot more to say about it. If memory games are your thing, then here's one to try. Anyway, the Spectrum Next. <laughs> we're oh, supposed to talk about Going on to the Spectrum Next, are we? Okay, fine. Uh, have, you, have you backed it? Oh, yeah. I was slightly late. I looked at it. Kickstarter, I'm a bit, I'm always a bit reluctant in Kickstarter because you're not guaranteed to get anything. No. And it was no. a lot of money. Mm. But then you kind of watch the videos and see, and I mean, Jim Bagley, we both met him yeah. once or twice at various events and stuff like that. Well, of course, you, you sat on the panel at, um, at Revival. Yeah. At Revival and with him and he's such a nice guy and you think well if he's there's probably nothing untoward if jim jim bagley's involved and well why why i i mean i backed it quite early i mean i didn't know about it until it was announced at play blackpool in april in 2016 
Yeah. And the reason I backed it is because at the at the time that they announced it, they'd already had pre-production boards made and tested and working. So it wasn't pie in the sky. It wasn't diagrams and rendered images of this is what we're going to do. It was here's a here's a couple of pre-production boards we've already built that are already working. And what yeah. we intend to do is then go forward and move you know move on and get a case and add bits onto it. So they weren't starting from nothing like a lot of the Kickstarters do. Yeah. I mean, the other rumour going round is they'll be here by Christmas. Right. We'll get them before before the end of the year. I yeah, think right. they're, they're officially supposed to ship in January, aren't they? But yeah, we're trying yeah. to get them done by the end of the year. All oh, right, but well, they, they keep adding things to it, which uh, I don't know. How, I mean, I, yes, it's great that they're putting extra bits in, but is it going to delay anything? Is it going to slow things down? That'll just be extra programming on the FPGA, won't it? Well, no, they started, so... they started adding an extra joystick port, and then then they upped the speed of the accelerator to give two more speed modes. Yeah, It's great that we're getting extra stuff. Oh, and they upped the memory, didn't they, from 512 to 1 meg as, as standard on all, um, all versions of it. But... You know, is this another a week delay, another month delay, or, or you know, is it is it like you say, just just tweaking something? Was it were all those upgrades because of stretch goals on the Kickstarter though? Uh, just... Some some of them were. The Wi-Fi yeah. board was a stretch goal, but the memory wasn't. Yeah. The memory was originally fixed at five twelve, and then was that chip a bit availability? I think I saw a video saying that they're having to do, or read something saying they had to do that because of the availability of the memory chips. They Possibly. basically couldn't get enough 512 memory <laughs> chips, so they had to make it a make. And I know there were pro- problems getting pies. The um, Raspberry Pis as the accelerators, they, they couldn't get enough of those at one point. I've not got an accelerator. Have you got an accelerated one? I haven't. Uh, no, I just got standard with the Wi-Fi. Yeah, I got standard with Wi-Fi as well. I, I thought, I can put my own Raspberry Pi in, and it feels yeah. like cheating having a Raspberry Pi in there. <laughs> Well, so, I mean, I don't know how many games are going to benefit from. It. I mean, all, all, obviously, all the 3D ones that they that they demoed when you see it, things like hard driving and stunt car racer. Yeah. But I'm not sure I want to play Manic Miner that fast. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Be a challenge. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Are you going to write any games for the next then, Paul? I don't know. I know Jonathan Caldwell's working on um, AGD, which I used for a lot of my games. So yeah. there's a possibility I might. Um, the problem is, it's what well, with adding all this extra stuff to it. I think they're they're doing what the PC market did. You know, you you, you write a game for a particular type now. So, are people going to write a game just for accelerated versions? Are people going to write ones for two meg games? Or, you know, two meg RAM? Is somebody going to write something that only does this and that? So it's difficult. You know, people are going to have to start targeting certain configurations, aren't they? Yeah. And the sound is there's now. It started off. I think it started off with two AY chips. Now there's three AY chips and two SID chips. <laughs> That's a lot of sound. <laughs> That's a lot of sound. Are people going to write specifically for a 28 megahertz, 256 color, six chat, six channel sound, or, or are they going to you know start limiting? I don't know. We'll have to wait and see, I suppose. Jim Bagley and Simon Butler are writing a game, aren't they? Simon Butler said yeah. on the Retro Gaming Roundup. Yeah, he's doing the graphics, isn't he? Yeah, they said it was going to be something like Starquake, which I I loved Starquake. I'm right. really looking forward to that if they do it. Um, well, I, I'm, I'm waiting for Jim Bagley's uh, Donkey Kong because that looks brilliant. I haven't seen that. It's, at the minute, it's, it's called Baggers on Ladders or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a dem- there's a couple of demos on YouTube on his on his channel that show the the barrels rolling down. It looks really good. You know, we, he showed us the static screenshot at uh, yep. Black, at Manchester last year. Well, yep, now it's written. Uh, yeah, now he's written a game around that. That thing oh, so cool. it looks very good, and he's also got some really good demos. He's got one of a, a picture of a cornfield, and every single line on the screen scrolls at a different speed, so you get this parallax effect. Oh, wow! And it's got a shadow, Bomb, shadow of the beast. Bomb well. Jack next looks amazing. Oh, I think I want to enjoy that. It yeah. just looks like the original. <laughs> Are you looking forward to it? I am actually. Yes, I recently got a recreated Spectrum to do a feature on. Hmm. And when that came through the door, it was like getting a, a new Spectrum for the first time. Now excited to get the, the next, because I want to see what the case is like, and I want to start um, using it and, and playing about with Jim's commands and doing all sorts, because he's, he's building a whole library of commands. Yeah. Um, and it'd be great to see what Jonathan Caldwell does with AGD and what op- what options he puts in there. I mean, obviously there's a lot more memory and a lot more storage with the SD card. Yeah. So hopefully, you you, you know, he's got the... That functionality is going to be extended and be able to produce some brilliant games. Yeah, keyboard looks nice. There was a lot of problem. But people were saying they didn't like the the keyboard style because they thought it was the same as the plus, but it's not. It just looks like the plus, but it's actually a proper PC style keyboard underneath. 
Is it? That's good. Mm. Well, I think the problem with the plus is there was the, the keys were too close together. You could easily double key. Yeah, they used to get they used to stick to each other and, and you yeah. Know, yeah. I'm I'm definitely looking forward to it. Can't wait to. And get I'll, it. Obviously, I'll, I shall do a feature on the show when it yeah. turns up. I'll reserve a slot. Well, you could just do a quick initial one, and we can. Well, you can um, review games for the uh, the next. That's yeah. Cool. Yeah. I know there's I know there's about four or five, isn't there? The Codemasters are putting out some dizzy games. There's going to be Rex. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to the Rex game. Right, yeah. Because you like Rex, don't you? I love Rex. Rex is a brilliant I, game. I think what I'd say is the Spectrum Next, uh, more desirable than the SNES Mini. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. And you're going to get one. And I'm going to get one, yeah. Is that this series full, then? Yes, yeah. Yeah. I thought it would be, so we'll have to start thinking of topics for the next series. In the early days of the Spectrum, it was not uncommon for games to change their inlays over time. Usually starting off with hand-drawn covers, as the finances improved, they could then release newer versions with better artwork, often moving from black and white to full colour. Many of the early companies did this, including Microgen, Rabbit, Arctic Computing, and DKtronics. It was much rarer, however, to find a game change and keep the original inlay. It's therefore even rarer to find a change of inlay and a change of game, but that's what seems to have happened with the DKtronics game Centipede. Originally, the game came with this nice two-colour cover in 1982. The game itself was written by David Helas, and is, as you have guessed, a version of the arcade classic. This was covered in my clone shootout in episode 54. Sometime later, the exact date is unknown, the cover changed to this much nicer drawn one. Then in 1983, the game name changed, at least on the inlay, to Centibug. This may have been linked to copyright issues, but the inlay is identical apart from that. However, inside, the game itself was still called Centipede, as can be seen from the loading screen. It is, though, a totally different game, this time written by Paul Johnson. Both games also have the same product code, DK04. So what's going on? The answer is, I've got no idea. I can understand an inlay change, but to change the name, inlay and game, but keep the same artwork and product code, is a bit of a mystery. For the record, the second game, Centibug, is the better of the two, but because of this mix-up it did not appear in my clone shootout. So should I do the shootout all over again? Absolutely not. There's no way I'm going to play all those games again, and I think some of you will be pleased to hear it.